So today we're gonna do something a little different. We are gonna dig up a relic from the past and it's an old gaming PC that I've had since the mid nineties. Uh, it's been in a box since the early 2000s. We're gonna see if it still works, check it out. So this PC used to be my gaming main gaming PC or one of my main gaming PCs. Um, I bought it from Fry's Electronics. Shout out to Fry's, RIP. Sorry, it didn't work out. Uh, we'll always have those memories though. I uh, spent a lot of money and a lot of time at Fry's. Um, anyway, that's where I got this one. It was a pre-built uh, PC and it was uh, by a company called Supercom, which I couldn't find a whole lot of information about, but I guess they built this PC. Um, over the years, I upgraded a few things to it. I'm not exactly sure what, but I think I may have added more RAM and I definitely changed um, the video card and I definitely added a network card. So I know I changed those things. I think most everything else is pretty much the same. Um, this, this, uh, like I said, was one of my main PCs for a long time. Uh, it just started to get older and older to the point where upgrading it didn't really make sense anymore. It's an old AT motherboard and uh after a while those like the case just wasn't compatible with new motherboards so it didn't really make sense for me to gut it and put a new pc in it so i think that's why this this machine ended up staying as period correct as it did because normally i take them apart and i change things out and they just become a mishmash of frankenstein things until i can't use them anymore um, but like I say, this one is pretty much period correct um, and the, it, it, for whatever reason. And uh, I, I remember the last time I used this was um, at a LAN party that I hosted at my house. Do you remember LAN parties? Those, those haven't been around for a while, have they? Um, LAN party, yeah. So we had a LAN party at my house and as far as I can figure based on clues in the picture, this was somewhere between 2001 and 2003 so probably within that range uh was when this this land party happened so at that point this old windows 95 pc was not usable for games uh but i did try to put it to use uh as an mp3 player uh we we had this weird setup because uh, I was desperately trying to fit as many computers as possible into this homeland party and so it was nice outside so we had this patio that was adjoining our guest room and so we set we decided the brilliant idea to set up some PCs out on the patio this turned out to be a terrible idea because of glare and a whole bunch of other reasons but we did it once and it didn't work out but i tried to set up this particular pc that we're going to be looking at as an mp3 player i hooked up speakers to it and pointed those speakers out the window onto the patio to kind of blast some tunes out there i had a win amp on this thing and it was struggling to keep up it it worked for a while and then it kind of crashed out a couple times and Eventually, I just decided it was too much trouble, uh, so I turned it off, and after that, I put it into a box, and in that box, it has stayed since till today, and, and this is 2021 we're talking, so uh, it's been in there probably about 20 years, or pretty close to 20 years, has not been turned on or really looked at. Uh, it's one of those things that I kind of forget I have until I have to move it somewhere. And then I realize, oh yeah, I still have this. Uh, but I, I kind of kept it for nostalgic purposes, I guess. And, and because I kind of knew I still had some files on there, I pretty much backed up all of them, but I don't know, I just kept it. Anyway, I don't have to have a reason. I don't have to justify it. I just still have it, okay? Um, 
So now I figure since uh, retro PC gaming is all the rage, maybe I'll bust it out and uh, see if it still works. I kind of have my doubts, honestly. Uh, main things I predicting are gonna go wrong with this is uh, the power supply might go bad because I know the capacitors on those tend to blow up after a while and, and leak and not work. So that would be a prime candidate for something going bad here. Um, and maybe the hard drive. That's another thing. Uh, there's not much else that could really go wrong, I don't think. So we'll plug it in and, and see uh, what happens. So now that we confirm this actually works, it's uh, worthwhile taking a closer look at the machine and, and the specs, and then we'll work on trying to get this to boot into Windows. So first things first, let's take a look at the back here. So I got I got a image here and uh, you can see, it, it's nice that I, I uh, thought to, uh, I thought to actually label this stuff. Um, so that that was good because some of these things I kind of forgot what they were like the parallel port. Um, so uh, yeah, that we had to use those for printers back in the day. So here here is the back of it. Um, you can take a look here. I'll put it up on the screen so you can see right off the bat the mouse port looks a little weird. Um, so what that is is an adapter, and it's an adapter from. Um, nine pin serial to PS2. Uh, so there's that. Um, and then there's the monitor that's straight VGA there. And then uh, below that, you've got a, a network card and you can see there's uh, the standard Cat5 ethernet port, but there's also this weird knobby protrusion. That would be a, a coax port and that's for uh, token ring networks. Go ahead and Google that and uh, learn yourself about some token ring networks because that's uh, that's some real back in the day stuff right there. Uh, and and yes, I have used this as a t on a token ring network. I that was my first network that I made was token ring network and it sucked. Uh, but pretty much everything network related sucked back in the day in Windows ninety five days. There was. It, it yeah not not great but we got it working and we we're able to play duke nukem and and counter strike and all that stuff uh back then so uh or whenever counter strike came out i don't even remember but um yeah that's that was our first networking games that we were playing and and command and conquer and and all the hits uh, and then below that, we've got a sound card of some kind there. We're going to dig into the exact specs there in a minute. Um, <clears throat> but just note, you've got the uh, 3.5 millimeter jacks for the stereo, the mic, and then I think there's an, uh, an out. I think that's what that's. I'm not sure what the third one's for. And then at, next to that is what's called a game port. And how these used to work was... Uh, if you bought a joystick or a game pad or something like that, it would have um, a connector that would connect to your game port. And that for some reason, I don't know why, but they were on the sound card. So that's what that was. Um, and then below that on the very bottom is the modem. And that's right. I actually used the shit out of this modem to dial up to AOL. Yeah. Don't be jealous that I've been chatting online with babes all day. 
So let's dig into the specs. I'm gonna bring up the spec sheet. So the CPU in this uh, machine is a Pentium P54C. That's important because this was the second revision of the original Pentium chip. The original one was just called the P5 that came out in 1993. This was a slight revision came out in 1994. Um, I think the main change was they made, they changed uh, how the voltage was handled and uh, made it a little bit more um, power efficient. Uh, so it didn't, didn't quite suck up as much juice, which was nice. So this is a very early example of the uh, Pentium processor. This ran at 75 megahertz. That's right. Not gigahertz, megahertz. Um, I think the machine that I'm actually making this video and editing it on is runs at four gigahertz. So that tells you how far we've come in the last 20 years from 75 megahertz being decently fast to four gigahertz. Um, this CPU is a socket five, which is interesting because uh, the motherboard is made by QDI and it is a bunch of letters and numbers, uh, Explorer two. It has a uh, speed easy BIOS on it and it is a socket seven. So how do we have a socket five CPU on a socket seven motherboard? Well, that's because socket seven was backwards compatible to socket five, which is pretty cool. Uh, the other thing cool about socket seven was it wasn't specific just to Intel chips. You could use AMD chips that were socket seven. There was Cyrix, Cyrix, I'm not sure how they pronounce that. Um, there were a few other, um, chip manufacturers that weren't quite as common that also worked on socket seven. Uh, so it was pretty, I guess, a universal, uh, socket type at that time, which I think is pretty cool. And I kind of wish they still did that. It's, um, then you wouldn't have to, if they still did that, you wouldn't have to worry about having an AMD specific motherboard to go with your AMD chip or an Intel specific motherboard to go with, a uh, Intel CPU. But it is what it is. That's how it worked out. Uh, but back then you could, anything that was socket seven or socket five could work on this motherboard. Um, a motherboard has four PCI slots, three ISA slots. That's, um, if you're not familiar with ISA that predates PCI. Um, so a lot of people at this time had devices that were both PCI and ISA. This particular machine has a mixture of PCI has two ISA devices, the sound card and the modem. Um, later down the line, a few years later, they'd started phasing out the ISA slots until there was, I think I had a few that only had one ISA slot on it. And then eventually ISA just disappeared completely. Um, but this one has almost half and half. It's four, four PCI and three ISA. Also the RAM on this motherboard is 16 megabytes, not gigabytes, megabytes, which was considered decent at the time. Um, and the, the RAM type was EDO RAM, which was uh, pretty fast for the time and improvement over the previous type of RAM. Uh, so that's the motherboard, this, the RAM and the CPU there. The hard drive is by JTS Corporation, and it's a champ model, whatever. The interesting thing about JTS Corporation is um, it it bought out Jack Tremell's Atari. So that means uh, after the failure of the Jaguar system, um, Atari had to do something. So this JTS Corporation came along they bought out Atari. Uh, that was in 19, February 13th, 1996 that that happened. So in a weird way, this is an Atari hard drive, I guess. Uh, so I thought that was kind of a, a fun little weird connection. The other thing I've noticed about this particular hard drive is I've done a little bit of research on it and everyone who talks about it on online doesn't have great things to say about it. Apparently they're not very reliable. Uh, they, they tend to fail. So that's worrying. Uh, probably gonna, if it, like I said at the beginning, if something fails, it's probably going to be the power supply or the hard drive. Well, the hard drive is looking like a candidate here. 
Uh, CD-ROM drive is a pioneer and those things last forever. I think this is a 12X uh, speed. Uh, the sound card is an ESS. ES1868, which is a Sand Blaster 16 clone and a pretty good one from what I've been able to read about it. Um, and this is an ISA slot um, uh, sound card. So um, this is this is the old format of, of card here. Um, the uh, next thing I'll talk about is we have a series of Creative Labs uh, products here. I interestingly enough, my sound card is not Creative Labs, but a bunch of other stuff in here is. So one thing about these two Creative products, I love how they're both called Blaster, the 3D Blaster and the Modem Blaster. It's you, you got to admire Creative's dedication to the Blaster uh, name, uh, because if you look through their product catalog, uh, especially in, in this era, they're releasing, you know, a CD drive. Well, let's call it the CD blaster. Uh, and then they had the, uh, you know, the 3d blaster. That's our video card. And we've got the, uh, network blaster. That's the network card. We've got the broadband blaster. We got the modem blaster. We got everything blaster ironically um the thing that's not the blaster is like their gaming products like their uh joysticks you'd think they'd want to call that something blaster but no they they decided to quit there so the video card this is the 3d blaster um it is called the ct6260 which i believe is a second revision of this card which means it's slightly faster than the original 3d blaster this features the v1000 chipset and this is an early uh, 3d accelerator made by a company called rendition which is ba based in uh, mountain view uh, the v1000 card came out around 1996 right in the middle of the 3d accelerator wars i don't know if that's a real thing but uh we had ati had their rage card s3 had the verge uh 3dfx had the voodoo line of cards i think um Nvidia was about to make um, the TNT cards. Uh, Matrox had a card. There's a bunch of uh, competitors out there for the 3D accelerator throne here. Um, unfortunately, uh, Rendition didn't make it. Um, they ended up being bought out by um, Micron. Um, later on and got integrated into into that company and um they, they only made uh i think the v1000 and the v2000 i believe are a couple different variations there and then they got swallowed up by micron and, and that was pretty much all you heard from them um but it is a solid card um for for that era and uh does pretty good uh 3d accelerations for things like quake and and the titles that were popular then this was my first 3d graphics card actually um and i my first experience i still remember was uh dark forces 2 jedi knight uh i remember going into the menu and you know the the game looked the same after i put the 3d card in there so i didn't really know what was happening or why having a 3d card was important until i realized there was a checkbox in the menu that said enable 3d acceleration or something like that i clicked that went back into the game and my mind was blown because it was colored lighting and look at how smooth it looks and it looked amazing and from then on i had to have a 3d card in every pc that i had and i think the next one i bought was the reva tnt but somehow i still have this one it still works um so moving on uh we, we've covered all pretty much all the specs i'm not going to really talk about the modem or or the network card too much um like i i showed before it it does boot or it posts i guess um we haven't really got past the bio screen at this point so th two two or three things need to happen number one i gotta replace the bios battery so we gotta do that which is easy 
Um, they still make those. They're still the same battery that's used in this is the same one we use today in all the motherboards. So that, those are easy to get. Um, then we got to find a serial mouse and a, a replacement um, keyboard because those two things are not working currently. Keyboard's easy. I happen to have a, a P PS2 keyboard around that I can use. Um, finding a serial mouse turned out to be harder than I thought it would be though. Um, even though I have a serial to PS2 adapter, not any PS2 mouse will work, which I found out the hard way. I have loads of PS2 mice. None of them work. Um, came to find out for this particular use case, you need a, it has to actually say in the description, it's a PS2 slash serial mouse, which I don't have. So uh, I looked around, I actually, my friend gave me this. This is called the Cyberman by Logitech. And this um, came out, this is a serial device. And um, this I is a weird, mouse like device, but it's attached to it and it's it goes forwards and backwards and side to side. And I think it's meant for shooters or something. I'm not really sure why this exists, but it does. It's not very good. So anyway, it worked. And that's the important thing. Um, and shortly after I tested with this, I actually was able to find an actual serial mouse. So I, I changed over to that one and then all is well. Two hours later. So we've booted and we've booted into Windows 95, which is still on this machine, amazingly. And all the drivers are still installed and uh, programs are still there. There's Duke Nukem 3D still on there. We still got Word on there. We got AOL on there, so that's good. We got Instant Messenger, that's great. Netscape Navigator, yes. So um, I was able to connect this to the internet, amazingly enough. Um, I didn't get too far because uh, these browsers are so outdated that all the new stuff on today's websites won't even load on it. So a lot of times it comes up with an error or has problems with the security certificate or, or something. So I, I was able to get to Google, um, Googled a few things. Most of the links I wouldn't be able to go to because um, the websites were too new, but I thought it was amazing that I was browsing the internet with a, a machine from around 1995. Um, so that's fun. I still have Word documents on here from back then. I've got Christmas lists of toys and stuff that I wanted. Um, I got a bunch of homework and uh, stupid stuff that I wrote down back then. So this is truly a time capsule from 1995 and it still works amazingly. I can't believe that hard drive, the JTS hard drive still works. That's that's the one that um, I'm, I'm most impressed by uh, given all of the negative reviews and how poor quality I heard they were, it still works. Might be one of the last working ones in the world, who knows. Um, 
So anyway, this is my 1995 time capsule that I wanted to share with all of you and show that uh, after 20 years, it still actually works, uh, or it's more than 20 years actually, but 20 years since I powered it on. Um, and uh, and it's, it's still going. So I'm gonna probably make some uh, retro PC uh, videos or something with this in the future. So stay tuned for that. And thanks for watching. Uh, you know what, this one's dumb, dump it, trash it, this one's garbage.